All right, so we're right at two o'clock. So I'd like to welcome everyone to our panel today on uh, baseball's collective bargaining agreement. Um, timely topic with um, baseball just going in a lockout here in the last few days. Um, thank you all for joining us kind of as a uh, initial note, um, we'll note that we are recording this session. So if you do have objections to your picture um, and or voice, if you're participating, uh, appearing on the Sabre YouTube channel down the road, um, just mute and or uh, um, turn off your camera um, at this time. Um, today we'll look to have um, about a 45 minute or so discussion with our panelists and then we'll open it up to live questions. If you have any questions that come up during um, the panel discussion, you can feel free to submit them through the chat box and um, may tailor questions and answers towards those. And then we'll spend about 10 or 15 minutes at the end where we unmute everybody and just kind of have a free conversation with the whole group. Um, so by way of introductions, uh, my name is Ryan Brecker. I'm chair for the Luke Easter Sabre chapter, which is the uh, Western New York chapter, which uh, covers the Rochester and Buffalo area. Um, we have uh, three great panelists for our talk today um, who should hopefully be uh, pinned and highlighted on your screen so they'll stay up near the top for you. Um, our first panelist to introduce is Mike Hoppert, um, who's professor of economics at uh, University of Wisconsin La Crosse and um, co-chair of the base Business of Baseball Committee. Um, he is a, a Chadwick Award recipient and has published um, more than 60 articles on the business of baseball and uh, compiled extensive database on a historical baseball salaries. Um, a lot of his work on a Babe Ruth salaries and earnings has uh, been in some recent publications. Um, next, I'll introduce Dan Levitt, who's author of several award-winning books and I'm current treasurer uh, for the Sabre Board. Um, he's the 2015 recipient of um, Sabre's Bob Davids Award, and um, he's had a wide and varied research career with uh, books on the Federal League, um, former Yankees general manager Ed Barrow, as well as the evolution of team building. And our third panelist is Jeff Katz, um, who is a Cooperstown resident and has served as mayor there for uh, six years. And um, he's the author of the book Split Season 1981, which uh, covers the uh, 1981 season from both the baseball and the labor perspectives. So thank all three of you for joining us. Um, Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Um, I think we'll uh, get started with um, what's the current state of the collective bargaining agreement and um, what's up with this lockout. We want to start on that. So whoever wants to jump in. My, my only thoughts on where we are right now is, first of all, it's been telegraphed for a few years. Everyone paying attention knew this was coming. It's not a surprise. But I think what's important to know, and Mike's done research on this and Dan's done research on this, is owners always do what owners do. And the, the commissioner's letter, <laughs> right, when the lockout started, was filled with so many lies uh, for positioning purposes, but also I think because they do believe in that. So when Manfred says we're forced to have a lockout, they're not forced to have a lockout. The lockout is unnecessary now uh, because the, the expired CBA uh, rules are in place until there's a new CBA. Um, the pulling down of all the players' faces and any current uh, stories on the MLB website is also false because my understanding is anything moving forward from right now doesn't need, uh, can happen. But any previously established images and text um, can happen. So it's another like spiteful, weird little thing to do. And, you know, the owners feel a bit triumphant uh, after the last CBA and are going to kind of push that as much as they can. It remains to be seen whether the players as a union have that strength uh, of unity that they historically did, which I have my own kind of theories <laughs> as to why they don't, but kind of fingers crossed, hope they do. So that's a, a synopsis of at least where I as a onlooker see the current situation. I would pretty much agree with exactly what Jeff just said. Um, you're absolutely right. There was there was nothing that 
required a lockout to occur right now, other than the owners wanting to get the immediate first leg up in these negotiations. Ultimately, they want to lock the players out before the players go on strike because they want the advantage in negotiating. And it's to their advantage to lock them out before anything starts. Because if the players are going to go on strike, they want to wait until later into the season when they've accumulated a lot of salary and the owners are still waiting for their, you know, uh, postseason TV checks. That's what happened in 1994. And that's almost certainly what would have happened if they had not locked them out and they weren't able to come to an agreement by, say, July. Then you'd be looking at the potential of the players, you know, going on strike and inflicting greater damage on the owners than on the players. But here's the thing that that we have to understand is that neither side is going to be able to financially squeeze the other side in a short period of time. So locking the players out now imposes zero economic impact on them at this point because the players aren't being paid. And as Jeff said, the players have really been gearing up for this since they had their butts handed to them in the last negotiation. Remember they negotiated this CBA. And by they, I mean Tony Clark, who they realized and Tony Clark realized had absolutely no business negotiating that last contract. He should not have done it. He had no experience and he was overmatched and taken advantage of immediately. And they recognized it. That's why they hired the um, Meyer, you know, three years ago. They didn't wait until three months ago. They hired him almost immediately okay. after that contract. And they've also been building up a war chest. So you know, you've got multimillionaire players who are, they could easily go a year without a salary and not miss a beat. Mm -hmm. And there's enough money in that war chest that they've been building up to keep even those younger players going for a whole year. They could miss an entire year. And the owners, none of them will miss anything financially if they go without uh, income from baseball for a whole year, because they can reduce their costs to almost nothing. Most of their costs are player salaries, which they won't have to pay. And not one owner depends on baseball for their livelihood. Not one depends on baseball for their livelihood. It's ego building, it's attention, and it's extra cash on the side for them. Uh, one thing I would just I would like to add, though, relative to the owners doing the lockout now, is that the collective bargaining or the collect um, the, uh, the the luxury tax. Um, does has a sunset in the current agreement and so if they went into the season without a new cba there would be there would be no luxury tax there'd be no competitive balance tax and i can't see the owners wanting to do that and okay. so i don't know that we had to do it in december but i can't see a scenario where the owners were willing to go into the season um, without a competitive balance tax in place interesting dan do you think that that's that that played in at all to uh, some of the recent signings? Uh, I, I Well, no, I don't think so. I think everybody just wanted to get the signings in while they had a chance because this could go on for a long time. I mean, I know we're going to talk a little bit later about sort of how we all see this coming out. Um, I just think that people saw a December 1 deadline and, you know, you had teams like the Rangers that had money to spend and wanted to sign players and went out and do it. I don't think anybody expects, I mean, once you had the lockouts, there, there, there's not going to be any more games or the season's not going to start until there's an agreement. As far as I can tell, I can't see some sort of interim agreement as, as you know, just probably written about, I don't remember specifically in your book, but in 1980, they sort of came to a, a, an agreement, but they just punted on all the hard stuff. They just punted on the, on the, yeah. you know, on the compensation free free agency, which was the key issue. And so you know, you could see something like that, but I don't see any scenario where the owners would reopen this without actually having some sort of agreement or, or temporary agreement in place. I think I have I have um, a somewhat perverse look on the signings that occurred in the week to two weeks before the deadline. Um, and I wouldn't say it was collusive. But I think in the kind of court of public opinion, and we've already seen the commissioner's office ownership, some media talk about it, by signing a handful of over 30 year olds to huge contracts, publicly they can say, this proposed shift in free agency and arbitration to younger players is, is a pointless exercise on the union's 
side, because look at 37 year old Max Scherzer, look at 30 year old Corey Seager, the over 30s just got huge contracts. So what are you talking about? Um, again, I don't think there's a collusive element, but I think there's an element of like, if you're thinking of signing those guys, sign them before December 1st, it works for us. Um, because I think that's the way it's played out. Um, there's always going to be kind of jockeying in media and, and social media, uh, which is a huge difference between 1994 or five, where any baseball talk was confined to message boards, you know, and in 1985 and 81, it was confined to nothing, right? It was confined to the press and letters to the editor. Um, so you already see fans who I never understand taking the owner's side, you know, <laughs> I hate these millionaire players. I'm on the side of the owners is the most odd logic pretzel to, to me. Um, so I think those signings had a strategic value for the owners negotiating. We'll see if that pans out, but I think publicly it felt that way. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that, but I did see a couple of reports, and I'm gonna speak from the player side here, why some of the players wanted to do this. There have already been a couple of reports and I have not seen any contracts or details but I would be very surprised to find out that all, if not most, of the players who signed got a signing bonus, meaning they got cash up front, regardless of whether there's a lockout that goes into the season, they're going to have a seven-figure to ten-figure payment in their hand, mm -hmm. which guarantees that their salary will, it might be effective, but they're going to get a large chunk of cash up front. Yeah. Typically, you see signing bonuses in football contracts because of the way they're structured and they're not guaranteed the players getting their their signing bonus that's their guaranteed money in this case the signing bonus is the guaranteed money for 2022 even if the season starts you know a third of the way through and their salaries are proportioned that signing bonus would not have been affected by that so that's one reason that players might have been anxious to sign because it, it guarantees them you know a big chunk of money before anything happens and they don't have to worry about what the outcome is and there is some precedent to that in 81 and maybe in 94 too. In 81, there were not that many, but there were uh, a handful of guys, Steve Garvey, Rod Carew, who had in their contract that they would get paid during work stoppages, which certainly angered some other players who hadn't thought that through. So it does make sense if you're a free agent and you can protect yourself for one year, um, you know, why not? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, my only comment would be, and I, I, I you know, I, clearly there's a value, a media, you know, effect of being able to say we signed all these guys, but, you know, it was, it was the top, it was the top free agents. I mean, the union position has always been that it's the second and tier, third tier free agents that, right. you know, once they're in their late twenties, early thirties, that that's where the issue is that those players are valued much differently by the teams than they were when free agency was put in place. And, you know, most of those players were, were getting relatively small contracts. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I think this was more of teams looking for a chance to grab guys before this deadline. And, but, you know, clearly being able to say, we put, I don't know what the number was, another 1.7 billion or some, when they added up all the salaries, I think clearly, you know, the, the owners are going to use it as well as they can, but I, I don't really see anything there beyond normal market activity. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think one of the things that the players are not acknowledging here is mid-level players have always gotten the shaft because if a team is short on cash, it's always cheaper to bring up a young guy who might be able to produce as well as a middle tier guy. We already know he's only going to be mediocre, but in the past <laughs> decade with the change in technology and the ability to, to be able to measure things that we now know predict well how players are going to play, like spin rates and launch angles and velocity of, you know, exit velocities. We can now, not we, teams can now project a little bit better which of these players are actually going to be able to succeed at the major league level. And why not bring up a guy who's only going to be making half a million dollars, who's almost certain to be as good as a 31-year-old guy who I'm going to have to pay $8 million. And what we found is the gap between our, our confidence in the ability to project a minor leaguer into the major leagues has gotten a lot better. It used to be that you would take the 31-year-old guy because he had eight years of major league experience, and that was a much better predictor than minor league experience.
But now we know if you can hit the ball at 110 miles an hour, and if you've got a spin rate of, you know, 533 RPMs, you're going to be able to succeed at the major league rate, but we are at the major league level. We can measure that now where we couldn't do that before. So part of this is just a changing economic picture that is never, is never going to work in favor of the players unless they get free agency from day one, which probably is never going to happen. And, you know, they, they have to know that's never going to happen. So that's, that's the, that's where I see this becoming a long lockout. If the players insist that they're going to get, you know, they're going to maintain arbitration and they're going to get one or two years shaved off free agency. And, you know, they're not going to be able to catch up with everything they lost in the last bargaining session in one bargaining session. They're going to have to be satisfied with, you know, taking one step towards the two or three that they want and then working in the next bargaining agreement to getting another step back, which I think they probably could if that's the if that's what they're thinking in the background publicly they certainly don't want to say that but hopefully that's what you know uh, Meyer has got them thinking that you you can posture yourself however you want but if you're holding out thinking you're going to win back everything you lost the last time be prepared to miss the entire season you know Mike I think you're too pessimistic on how the players did in 2016 I mean I think clearly the competitive balance tax should have gone up faster than it did um, just, you know, given where revenues were, maybe we should have, you know, should have been tied to a percentage of revenues, but the, the, the contract itself, I mean, you know, arbitration and free agency generally stayed in the same place that it had always been. And, you know, the, the issue is that, as we just talked about, that players are being valued differently. And at some point, you know, it's, it, you know, you got to get paid for perform. The players have to get paid for performance instead of on service time. It, and, and that's sort of what the union's looking at. But I, I don't think that in 2016, this was nearly as clear. I don't think it was nearly as big an issue. And in fact, you know, in 2016, they did get the um, the penalties for signing free agents reduced a little bit, the, the whole compensation thing. So, you know, what, what you know, what you surrendered if you sign a free agent. So I, 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 I don't I, I think a lot of this is more of changes in the game um, than the fact that that that. 2016 was such a debacle. I mean, obviously they hired Bruce Meyer and they're, you know, they, they, they got a, they got a plan and they got to try and, you know, look at the changes in the game, but you know, I'm not quite as negative on, on how they came out in uh, 2016, but for just sort of the, the increases in the competitive balance. And I don't, you know, I'm not sure that that was such an easy read either for them. Yeah. Ryan, we could keep on talking. I have, oh, some stories. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know if you have questions you want to get in. Yeah, no, we are going, no, this is exactly yeah. what I was hoping would happen. All right, so, so. Here, here's what I think um, is the problems of 2016, or let's say the current state of, of how the game is, is viewed. So um, the history of the union, starting with Miller in 66, and certainly through 81, and, and even through 95, is they had both a strategy and a purpose. And the strategy was to build incrementally to the elimination of the reserve clause. And the purpose was to be in a sense treated like every single person who's on this Zoom call is treated at work. You ask for more money, you don't like where you work, you leave the place you work and you go to a different place to work. Maybe you move from Buffalo to Chicago because there's a better opportunity. In essence, that's what the 81 strike was about. Don't baseball players deserve the rights of every worker in America? And Miller used to always frame these things in terms of workers' rights and the workplace situation. What the players have right now, and I think this is where they did go astray in 2016, they didn't seem to have a sense of a goal. So a lot of stuff was, was seemingly trivial, but they do have a goal right now. And that goal needs to be that <laughs> because of analytics, players are coming up earlier. As Mike said, you can pay 500 grand for a 22 year old instead of 5 million for a 31 year old and not give up any performance, maybe gain performance, who knows? Uh, people like Soto are coming up at 18, you know, <laughs> and won't be a free agent till till they're, you know, the owners proposed an age-based free agency. The players could come back strongly and say, here's what we want. We want um, 
arbitration, and I know this is being floated, after only a few years, we want free agency after a few years. The way the game has changed is shifting where people are getting play, paid to a younger age. Service time is less. Um, you know, we all read that stuff. At the core, though, the players have to want to have, uh, want is a better word. The players have to know that they will strike. The only recourse labor has is a strike. What, strikes are devastating to every industry. And I talked to Don Fear about this. Um, you know, when strikes became something that was off the table, all it did was hurt labor. We've seen that in unions across the country in every industry. So the players need to make that case. And as Mike says, maybe they get 30% of it this time and next CBA, they get another 30%. But they have to shoot for a changing of how the pay structure is set up. And the owners will not want to give any of that up. I think another solution or another goal for the players should be to start pulling these supposed non-baseball revenue streams into the pot. The idea that Major League Baseball owners have non-baseball revenue streams like MLB.com and all of baseball alternative media, it's all baseball income. MLB.com is, is a meaningless enterprise without any MLB players and games. So well, as how, we're seeing right now, right? As we're seeing, as we're right, seeing now. right now. I mean, what could the traffic on that site be right now? One day it was Met signed Scherzer and everyone was talking about it. The next day it's silhouettes of players. <laughs> um, so I think the union has multiple workplace conditions that they can fight for. Will they fight for it? I don't know. I don't know. Um, another thing Fear told me you know, years ago was when Tony Clark came in, he was worried there was going to be the perception that he's an ex-jock and as such is an idiot. Tony's not a dumb guy. Um, and whether he was outmatched or not, um, it's not a one man alone type of, type of operation, even before Bruce Meyer. Um, that being said, the union is aware and knows that they need to play a harder game here. And will they? I don't know. I mean, if the owners lock out the season, I don't know what that means. I know in 81, there was a sense that if the owners canceled the season, all contracts were voided. I don't know if contracts are written differently this way, but Miller had floated this idea of let's start our own league, take all these players, start a new league. And, you know, you could find cities with municipal, you know, not every stadium is built privately these days. Um, you could find municipal places to play. So I think the players have the potential of a strong hand Will they, will they play it? Maybe. I do think the owners are way more leveraged now. Uh, the Ricketts with their whole hotels and real estate <laughs> enterprise around mm -hmm. Wrigley Field, the Braves who are part of a publicly traded company, that's a real estate business at its core. I, I think there are issues that even though as Mike said, no one is making their money directly from baseball, those as separate businesses are very leveraged. I mean, I know that about the Cubs for sure. So the owners might have some difficulty and the owners historically have always underestimated how strong the players are. Um, they always think the players are going to crack. And as Seaver, Tom Seaver said in 81, he said, we're competitive people trained to be competitive team players. Why do they think we're going to fold? And I think that is true. I mean, professional athletes don't like to lose. Yeah, are there any... Uh previous CBA negotiations that you guys would think are most similar to uh, this year's? You know, we've highlighted some of the differences. Is there a... I'm not, I'm not really sure huh. any CBA bargaining has ever been different because at the heart, they all come down to one thing, and that's how to split up the revenues. Everything else really is window dressing. Um, the players would happily agree to have you know everybody be a free agent at 29 and a half if somehow the owners were able to give them enough money up front to make up for it for example what if the owner said look we don't want anyone to be a free agent until 29 but we'll raise the minimum salary to five million dollars and you have to get at least a 20 percent raise every year i think the owners the players would grab that right away i don't think the owners would give it but right. the point is 
everything is about money. And I'm actually fairly optimistic that the season will be played in whole because there's so much money out there that even a billionaire doesn't like to look at that much money getting wasted away, which is what's going to happen. For every game canceled, every single person will lose money. They can all afford to lose money in the sense that none of them will be on welfare. But as you pointed out, you know, as Jeff very eloquently said, these guys, not just the players, but the owners as well, are really competitive people. The owners compete ruthlessly in business. That's how they got to be this rich. And the players compete very ruthlessly on the field. And none of them like to watch games go away. And that's why I think that ultimately they will come to some sort of agreement, even if it means, as Dan pointed out, they pump the hard stuff and say, okay, let's agree on all these fringe things and we'll at least play this year and worry about, you know, the bigger issue, you know, exactly how long we'll go to free agency, et cetera. So that's, that's what I see. And ultimately, you know, going back to what Miller said, um, you know, in 1981, if those players had all become free agents, that is probably the best thing that could happen to the owners. Because if the market suddenly had 650 free agents, the best players, the absolute best players, Max Scherzer would still get his 30, you know, 39, $43 million a year. But almost all of those middle players are going to get it a lot worse if they're competing against all the other players than, you know, having two or three great pitcher free agents. So the owners really, or the players really, really do not want everybody to be a free agent at once. In fact, that was what the owners originally proposed back in the 70s. And that is exactly what Marvin Miller, um, you know, counseled the players not to do. Because he said, you're going to have a huge supply of players hitting the market, and it's going to dampen salaries across the board if you do that. Thank God the owners never listened to Charlie Finley back then. I would say that if you had to pick one, it would have to be the 1990 lockout, which, you know, was over the winter. Um, very, very similar in the sense that I think that the issues were not fundamental issues. I mean, one of the reasons I'm optimistic is you look at 1976 on the lockout, you know, it was, a, it was, it was fundamentally about what was free agent, are we going to have free agency? What's it going to look like? I think if you look at the 94 strike, you're fundamentally looking at, you know, the owners wanted a salary cap. Uh, you know, I, I don't think today, I mean, I don't think you really have these fundamental issues. I mean, I think the players union is trying to figure out some ways to, you know, get payers, players paid younger. But, you know, you're looking at five years of free agency versus six. You're looking at two years of arbitration versus three. You, you may not be able to bridge these gaps, but I don't see them as fundamental issues. Now, of course, in 1990, you know, Faye Vincent, you know, the owners complained that he pressured them to um, settle and, you know, obviously with, with Rob Manfred, it's a completely different deal, given that he's, you know, the owner's negotiator. But I, I really look at sort of 1990 as a pretty good proxy for, for what we have today. Yeah, like just, you know, brought up Faye Vincent. Um, yeah. you know, one of the things I wanted to touch on was um, how the role of the commissioner in the CBA negotiations has changed over time. Well, the, the problem with the commissioner is, up until Bud Selig became commissioner, the commissioners thought that they represented baseball. And I never understood why any commissioner thought that because they were hired by, paid by, and employed by the owners. The players had nothing to do with owning the, you know, choosing the commissioner, paying the commissioner. The commissioner is the representative of the owners. And when Bud Selig came along, Bud Selig was regarded by the owners as the greatest commissioner ever for very good reason. He was an owner when he became mm -hmm. commissioner. When he sold his team, he was still an owner who was commissioner. He was the perfect commissioner. And Rob Manfred was brought up through the system in that environment. And so Rob Manfred might be the very first commissioner who does not see himself as representing baseball, who really understands that he represents the owners. And I think that letter that he wrote was the most obvious example <laughs> that Rob Manfred does not believe that he represents baseball. He represents what the owners are trying to sell. And that's exactly what that letter read like. This is the owner's stance. And we're putting it out here from Major League Baseball as if, as a lot of fans might think, as if this is Major League Baseball, their perspective. Well, Major League Baseball is not just the owners. It's also all the players. And that is clearly not their perspective. It is the owner's perspective. But and I would say I mean, that's only within the last 30 years, right? I mean, yeah. but when, when Judge Landis was made commissioner, 
he, he was made commissioner over all of baseball. And the whole point of bringing in him was to sort of have someone above the game. Obviously he was hired by the owners and, and that, you know, and I, it became more and more of a fiction as it, as it went along. But nevertheless, I mean, clearly there was some of that, whether it was Bowie Kuhn or Vincent. I mean, there, there was always this sense that, that they were more than the owners. And I, I actually, I liked that. I mean, I think we all sort of got it intellectually that, you know, they owed their employment to the owners, but the fact that there was that, you know, sometimes they would penalize the owners for things and, and, and try and look beyond sort of the, the narrow, uh, you know, focus on the owners. I, I thought that was a positive. I, you know, I understand that, you know, Bud Selig's an owner and that we went a different direction, but I, I do think that, that, you know, the commissioners weren't necessarily negotiating. And I did think, I do think that caused some confusion in all those old negotiations, but, you know, I, I, I do th- that the, own, the, the commissioners, whether or not, you know, clearly they were in some way beholden to the owners because that's who hired them, but they viewed themselves um, much differently. And, and clearly, you know, someone like Bowie Kuhn did. I mean, he, he, he wasn't complaining to, 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 to Marvin Miller that, you know, he was being unfair to the owners. He was complaining that it wasn't good for baseball. And in all fairness, I think Bowie believed that. I mean, he was clearly out negotiated and, and believed it, but I, I, he, I think he was honest within his own light. I mean, he, he clearly believed everything he was doing was for the good of the game. I agree with you 100%. My contention was not that the owners were being facetious or the uh, commissioners were being facetious. It's that the owners never hired a commissioner that they intended to represent all of baseball, which is why they hire them and they fire them. And except for Landis, who died, every commissioner was fired by the owners when it got to the point where the owner said, you're doing things that we don't want you to do. And I agree, Bowie Kuhn loved baseball more than he loved any of the owners, which is why the owners eventually fired him. And Bowie Kuhn was quite upset about that because he believed and he thought that he was supposed to stand up for all of baseball. Whether he did that out of, you know, a sense of principle, I I suspect that's what it was because he had worked for the league as an attorney before that. So he had to know that the owners wanted a commissioner who would speak for them. But once in the commissioner's office, a lot of these guys, you know, they, they focus on their love of baseball and they, they try and be independent, but they really don't have the structure to be independent because they are beholden to the owners. And it wasn't until Bud Selig that the owners got the, the commissioner that they always wanted. And that was somebody who was their CEO, somebody who would speak for them. So that, that's the way I'm saying it is the owners always wanted a Bud Selig as a commissioner. And it wasn't until Bud Selig that they got what they really wanted. And that's why they, you know, they kept firing people before that. It's because they would eventually get to the point where they said, no, you're too independent. We don't want you to be that independent. You're supposed to be our guy. Well, I'll I'll say this about Kuhn. Kuhn was the first commissioner who couldn't be completely arbitrary. I, I, I would disagree that he was a man of principle and that he was a man with the greater good in mind because his fiats were consistently inconsistent. There was no through line other than I am the Oracle of baseball. Every commissioner before him could do that. There was no other side. It really took Miller um, to kind of puncture publicly that myth that the owner, that the commissioner was a, an honest broker for all of baseball. Um, as a negotiator, you know, Kuhn had no place at the negotiating table, ever. Um, it was the owners had their representative. The owners would have player relations committees to come up with policies. Kuhn was a spokesman, but often a spokesman on his own island and ignored, right? Um, so the firing of Kuhn, because, I mean, I don't think he was fired because he was in, independent. I think he was fired because he was incompetent. And it, and certainly the loss of Walter O'Malley um, was the beginning of the end of Kuhn because O'Malley had a lot of clout and O'Malley supported Kuhn. Um, but each, um, each commissioner was less attached to this Landis fantasy that they spoke for everyone. Um, and I think that's good. I mean, I think for the average baseball fan, um, you know, I always say, like, if you believe baseball is only business, you're too cynical. And if you believe it's only the game, you're too romantic. It's always been a business. This idea that somehow when all of us were 12, 
it was this pure spirit of the game. Owners and players alike didn't care. The only reason players, quote unquote, didn't care about their salaries is because they had no control over it. Um, so the loss of commissioners perceptively as, as the ambassador of the game, I think is healthy. Clarity is, is healthy. Um, someone had put out something on social media saying, we really do need kind of a person who represents fans, owners, players, whatever. But they don't have, the fans have no clout. The fans, fans have never had clout. And what professional sports has always shown to fans is they are the most expendable because they come back. I think someone earlier said in the 94 strike, I'm just looking at the chat, that baseball lost America. Yeah, maybe for a few months. Baseball has gone from a $2 billion business to a $12 billion business with more people in the stands, more attention, more audience internationally. Baseball has never been more popular. And the fans come back. The fans always come back because they're fans. So, you know, the fans have no say in any of this. It's owners versus players. And pre-1966, it was owners versus nobody. <laughs> I mean, when, when the Braves moved from Boston to Milwaukee, he didn't poll the Boston Braves fans to see if he thought that was a good thing for the team and baseball in general. When the Dodgers and Giants moved, there was no canvassing of New York City baseball fans. This idea that owners care about fans is, is absurd. It's provably absurd. Um, so I think having a commissioner who is just the owner's guy makes it all very, very clear how this will play out. And, you know, Manfred's good at what Manfred does. I mean, I, you know, I think he is, if not beloved, like Selig as kind of a transformational figure. But I don't hear that there's any problems, <laughs> you know, from the ownership side in terms of Manfred's job performance. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. But I would say one thing. The players always have cared about their salaries. Before Marvin Miller came along, most of them had almost nothing they could do about it, though. Yeah. For every Babe Ruth who actually could go in and effectively, you know, threaten to hold out and probably make as much money as off the field as he did on, there were a million players who had no ability to do that. And Joe DiMaggio yeah. held out. And when he came back, they docked his salary that they had offered him right. for missing the first two weeks of the season. Yeah. And it wasn't and until even, Miller that players actually got some leverage. And even further, and you know, this is slightly off topic, but not off topic for what you just said, Mike, this idea that there was a time that there was loyalty is also crazy. I mean, there's a famous thing in Boys of Summer where Ferrillo had a broken ankle, was coming back, um, was in spring training for the Dodgers who he had played for for 13 years, 14 years. And he was cut with like days to go before the end of free agency. There was the only loyalty was an imposed loyalty because the players couldn't go anywhere. The owners had no loyalty. The story of how the Tigers dumped Hank Greenberg because Briggs saw a picture of Greenberg in a Yankees hat and had no idea why he was wearing that. And he sold them to the pirates. Owners have no loyalty to players, to cities, to fans. It's, it's, there's no historical documentation that would back that up. So, um, I mean, I do think it's in a better, we're in a better world in professional sports. And I think the average fan fantasy that, you know, if it wasn't for unions, tickets would be a quarter and hot dogs would be a nickel. Uh, <laughs> there's no other kind of product on the marketplace whose prices are the same as they were 50 years ago, let alone five years ago. So yeah, I think no, everyone- that's, could... That is absolutely hundred percent true. I mean, yeah. the idea that, that, you know, the owners pitch this idea that player salaries drive ticket prices, but Ticket prices are driven by the fact that there's one team in every city, except for the three largest cities in the in the United States, where they have enough people they can support two teams. That's why ticket prices are high. That's why fans keep coming back. There aren't any really good substitutes for Major League Baseball. Minor League Baseball is good, but it's not the same thing because all the best players have already moved up. So that's why the fans keep coming back. And that's why the ticket prices are high because people are willing to pay them. Yeah, true. Sure. Yeah, and of course, um, you know, Western New York here, we don't have Major League Baseball, but we do have Minor League Baseball. Um, 
if the lockout did extend into the season, what kind of effect would this have on the minor leagues? The minor leaguers are not part of the union. So they will be able to play minor league baseball and it doesn't affect the, the bargaining agreement at all. In fact, right now, my players not on the 40 man roster can even use team facilities. They can get guidance from teams on how to do rehab. So as long as they're not, you know, uh, have never been in the majors or they're not part of the 40 man roster, they can, you know, they're completely outside of this. They have as much to do with the union right now as I do. They're not <laughs> part of it. They never have been. Right. And, and furthermore, I mean, the, what, what becomes a pressure point for minor leaguers is if they're asked as, as they have been historically to cross picket lines, to come in as replacement players, most, minor leaguers don't make that choice because they hope for a career <laughs> and they don't want that career to start as a strike breaking player who when the strike settles which or lockout settles whatever we may be in next next year um they don't want a 10-year career where they're hated by every teammate they have yeah. um and that that's been true historically so um i know in 81 the orioles had um both uh, Mark Belanger and Doug DeSensei were part of the four-man player uh, negotiating team. Um, so Belanger asked Ripken, who was in Rochester, you know, <laughs> what are you thinking if they ask you to come up? He's like, nope, not not going to do it. I mean, you can, can you imagine Cal Ripken's reputation if he had started his career <laughs> as a strike-breaking shortstop? It, it certainly mars the image. Um, so I think minor league baseball will continue, but you know, as we as we saw last year during COVID, major league baseball couldn't give a darn about minor league players <laughs> yeah. and whether they play or not, and what conditions they play in. So, you know, that's another thing to disabuse yourself of that <laughs> that major league owners have a, a real caring feel for their minor league teams. Yeah, on both sides, both the union and the majors, um, the minor leaguers seem to be lost. Um, is there is there a good reason why the union doesn't try to in, doesn't try to fight harder for minor leaguers or incorporate them more? Well, yeah, at, at a basic level, you don't want too many people in your union because then you have to split everything up among more people. Minor leaguers aren't going to be able to afford to pay union dues without major league teams paying them more money, which they finally agreed to give them a little more money. But the players don't want the minor leaguers in their union. They, they have enough to do with their own union right now. Those people join the union when they come in. And it works out very well for the major leaguers because they don't have to worry about protecting the minor leaguers. But the minor leaguers know that they can't, they're, like Jeff said, they're never going to cross that line. Because this is a, this is not just a monopoly, it's a monopsony. There's really only one major league employer. There's no place else they can go. So it's, it's not like a scab and a steel mill who crosses a line and who could then, you know, get a job somewhere else as, you know, as a laborer. If you cross the line to play, you know, a strike line in major league baseball, there's only one place you're ever going to be able to play major league baseball. And they may never give you the time of day and that would be a really difficult, you know, situation to walk into. So they've got the best of both worlds. They know that the minor leaguers aren't going to cross them. They aren't any threat to their, you know, to taking their jobs away. Like, you know, if I work at a steel mill, anybody, anybody off the street could come in and take my job. And if enough of those people are out there, which there are plenty of people who could do it, that's what makes it a lot harder to maintain you know, a complete shutdown when you're striking at a, an industry where there are, you know, millions of potential substitute workers. There are only a couple thousand potential substitute workers for Major League Baseball. And they know very well that if they cross, they may never get to the goal, which is the Major Leagues, in their life. So Major Leaguers have a strong ally in the Minor Leaguers in the sense that they'll never cross. And yet they don't have to include them in any benefits, any, anything they do. And fundamentally, I, I would just different. add that it, it, it's it's I mean, there's one historical precedent. I mean, just give, coming out of the federal league, there, 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 there was a sort of a nascent players union that actually had a little bit of power during the federal league war, mainly because they had two leagues battling against each other back in 1914 and 1915. And that union did include the minor leagues. And coming out in 1916, um, when all the players were getting their salaries slashed, 
um, the the union actually tried to do a strike before the 17th season to um, and, and essentially was going to benefit minor leaguers who had terrible work rules. And I don't think there was any real chance that that union wasn't going to survive anyway, uh, given that you had the whole weight of baseball now against it and no sort of federal league to play off against each other. But there, it was clear that, that, you know, trying to strike for minor league work rules, even no matter how egregious they were, you just weren't going to get major leaguers to sign off on that. Um, and, you know, I think you probably have the same issue now where it's just tough enough to be a major leaguer and tough enough to fight for your own rights. Um, you know, and also try and, you know, include minor leaguers in that, I think would just be, you know, almost, I don't know how you could succeed. Yeah. And I, guess, I mean, they're fundamentally different jobs, right? We can say they're all ball players, but, you know, you could extrapolate that and say, why doesn't the ML? BPA represent college baseball players. Um, as mayor I, I, uh, of Cooperstown, I, I was involved in labor negotiations, and there was a union for the police, and there was a union for the public uh, work department. Uh, the office staff have no union, and maybe there is a union of municipal office employees that they could have joined. I don't know. But the guy who worked at the water plant wasn't going to join the police union. <laughs> They basically had to go out and start, you know, become a, a part of the Teamsters to represent their class. So, I mean, there's a romantic notion that, you know, all the players are together, but major league players and minor league players are completely different job descriptions and their goals are not the same, right? So, you know, major league baseball is looking at what should be the rules of free agency for major league players of five, six, seven years, Minor league players are like, can I not sleep in my car, <laughs> right? So how do you have one union represent those things? They're very different things. Um, I'm not saying the minor league players shouldn't have a union. Look, the college athletes have fought long and hard to get eventually where they got, where they can get compensated in, in ways for their services, which they, I think, always should have gotten. So there are ways for minor leaguers to kind of represent themselves. Um, who knows? I, I don't know if that's ever been really explored because that, that populace shifts so much. You know, no one wants to be a 10 year minor leaguer. They want to <laughs> they want to get out of there and then join the, the big union. All right. It's hard to believe we're already at 10 to three. So <laughs> we'll uh, move this along and um, kind of close this part of the program with um, what you guys see as some of the um, bargaining ships that we're going to see being played on either side and uh, what your expected uh, resolution, um, both time frame and uh, kind of outcome of this negotiation is going to be. Well, I would say that the bargaining chips on the player side are, you know, will agree to expand the playoffs. Um, you know, they can agree to allow, you know, agree to uh, luxury tax levels they could, you know, they could agree to a certain number of years of free agency. Uh, the DH, I don't think, is is a big issue, but it it does have to be collectively bargained. Uh, they'll they'll throw that out there, even though they want it probably more than the owners do. But on the owner side, I can see them raising the minimum wage, perhaps building in guaranteed, you know, raises beyond the first year. Um, I think the trickiest thing is going to be whether they actually, you know, whether, I think the trickiest thing might be the service time issue, because this is really a legitimate complaint on the player's part that the owners manipulate, you know, I'm a Cubs fan and there was no way that Chris <laughs> Bryant should have been starting 2015 in the minor leagues. Everybody knew that. And yet everybody knew that major league baseball had the right to do it. They, there was, he was never, they were never going to lose that, you know, that uh, complaint because it was in black and white in the agreement that the owners got to make that decision. Ultimately, perhaps the best thing the owners could give up that might save them having to you know, give up a year of free agency is to say service time starts as soon as you appear on the roster the first day. Then that counts as the whole year. Now, what that does is it benefits the players tremendously because then the teams aren't going to be Mickey Mousing around, you know, trying to find the date that they can bring this guy up that he still doesn't get that year of service. But it also incentivizes the teams to bring up these young players. 
Because if I've got a 19-year-old guy in the minor leagues who I think can outproduce my 32-year-old guy, I might as well bring him up when he's 19. It's going to cost me a year of service, but I get the whole year with him. And I have six years of control over this guy. He's only going to be 25 when he becomes a free agent. But I have six years to try and sign him to a longer term contract, for example. And we know what can happen. <laughs> you know, Wander Franco is not 30 years old. He's the one big exception <laughs> to what, you know, uh, was pointed out before. He got a big contract and he didn't even have a full season yet. Right. So it is possible for these things to happen. And I, I see that as potentially the, the biggest bargaining chip is the players, you know, the owners give up this uh, service time issue. And the players back off on the number of years to free agency, because if a 19 or 20 year old, you know, comes up at any time and that gets to count as our first year and there's no more of this partial year stuff, Mm -hmm. then they're going to hit free agency when they're younger anyway. Hmm. Good point. I think um, I saw Adam um, wrote, like, what do the players have to offer besides expanded playoffs, which I think um, is what the owners want, because the owners get pretty much all the playoff money. The players get to share in i think gate receipts of the first three games it's a if it's a three of five or four games if it's a four of seven because historically you want to discourage players from having a financial incentive to continue a series so the owners benefit more from playoffs than the players but ultimately what the players have to offer is baseball if anyone on this call is looking forward to seeing Tom Ricketts talked to Hal Steinbrenner about the state of their, you know, profit sheets. That's not what I'm interested in watching. The players are the game. End of story. There's nobody on this call who truly thinks otherwise. They might think their players are greedy, that the owners are greedy, whatever. We all come to it because of the play on the field. And ultimately, that's the player's strength if they choose to use it. They are the game. And if you want to tell Mets fans that, fine, we signed Max Scherzer, but instead we're going to bring up some guy from Binghamton and he's, you pretend he's Max Scherzer now <laughs> and come to the game and see it. There are Mets fans who are Mets fans and they'll come. But to squander that, thrill that Met fans got for that day before the lockout or half a day um, is is pointless. We all know that we watch the sport because of the players who play it. And that's true for baseball and football and basketball and hockey and everything. And that is ultimately what the players have to offer. Let, let, let me just add, I think that's good. Let, let me just add w- w- one comment. And, you know, we haven't seen this kind of work stoppage in the age of sort of modern social media. And I, I think that that's going to be, and, and, and you know, mm-hmm. to, to be successful, you have to have unity on both, you know, either side. You, you have to have unity and you have to other other side believe that you're unified. I, I actually think sort of modern social media is going to make it harder on the players, just given that they all have their own social media outlets. They have a lot more people pushing at them. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I may be wrong. It may be tough, may make it tougher on the owners, but I don't think we've seen this before. And you know, I think how social media reacts to this over the next 90 days is going to be very telling as to which direction this goes. I, I will say, you know, I think one of the things that was, at least for a day, a PNR uh, disaster was taking the players' faces from MLB.com, and 100% of the players that tweeted changed their profile pic to be their dark silhouette from MLB.com. <laughs> and um, I think that... Um, in a social media world where I believe there's a hashtag that exists, Manfred hates baseball. I do think, I, I, I think the players have an advantage on this in social media because people, yeah, people want to say like, you're a greedy pig. Like people, instead of, instead of commending Scherzer for saying you just got a monster contract. Yeah, the system's so bad for you. Why are you fighting for the younger players? He should be rewarded for that. He, this is the historical point of the union was that Seaver and Bench and Carew, these guys were front and center of the fight for the Bill Steins of the world. That, that should be applauded, not 
mocked because Scherzer said exactly what you would hope a guy like him would say. I know I got mine, but there are bigger issues that we need to address for the game. Um, so I think the owners who have no social media voice, um, which could benefit them, right? They're not in the fray. Um, the social media voice that's going to take the owner's part is going to be some members of the press and a bunch of fans who are going to be like, <laughs> I'm on the side of Steve Cohen, you know, indicted insider trading guy. I mean, I, I kind of, when I was an options trader, I knew him a tiny bit. It's like to have fan support for a guy like Steve Cohen is nuts nuts so there are fans out there who are going to be like thank god steve cohen you you give it to javi baez it's like meanwhile every met fan i read is like i miss javi baez already so i i actually think the players will win that public battle and historically when when everything was played out in newspapers the owners always had a press edge the democratization of access i think diminishes the owner's clout in what they say. Just as we're talking about Manfred's letter, it was met with pretty much ridicule everywhere I turned. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Jeff, that I think the players, first of all, the players have way more Twitter followers than any owner does. I think the players probably have the social media advantage, but I don't think that's what Dan was suggesting. And it's certainly not what I think. It doesn't matter what you or I or the public thinks. That's not going to affect this outcome. If the players are tweeting different messages, that's a signal to the owner that they're not as unified as possible, and that will give the owners a bargaining advantage. That's where I think the owners have the advantage, because there's only 30 owners. They're not as active on social media, and it's easier to police 30 people. They can find each other. And they've done it before when owners have spoken out right. a turn and said something that the owners didn't want said. They bring the hammer down on that guy. Right. And it's easier to do that with a group of 30 than with a group of 600 major leaguers and 1,200 you know, guys on 40-man rosters. Right. So for that reason, I think that the social media, while it's going to bring more publicity on the side of the players, mm. it also has the danger of exposing rifts that the players don't want the owners to know about. Let, let me give you a little historic bit that feeds into that, and it goes back to the primitive world of 1981. As the strike was kind of winding down, and there was a meeting in Washington between the owners' reps and the players' reps, all of a sudden, Ray Greeby, the owners' rep, stopped the meeting and walked out. What had happened was Dave Lopes had talked to um, a, a reporter in Long Beach, California, kind of slamming the union reps basically like who the hell is Bob Boone he doesn't know anything like and it made the owners say we got him what ended up happening is the players union had um, a meeting in LA Chicago and New York to talk about it Lopes basically apologized to everybody and the players left more unified so I, I think you're right if if the owners or Manfred or whoever's in the comms department sees that, uh, I don't know, I can't think of, of, of a good example offhand, saying, you know, the players are asking too much and I, I want to get back on the field. That is more of a misinterpretation, right? If, if 300 players <laughs> on social media say it, yeah, you got something. But I, I think there is a danger of extrapolating from one person's comments. Um, and I think that, that is certainly a dangerous and unproductive line owners have have followed before. So, but it remains to be seen. It's going to be fascinating to to watch what people say on media, people who are in the fray, as opposed to people like us who just snipe from the sidelines. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, I think we'll kind of end the formal part of our <laughs> program here. Um, if anyone has any um, kind of last minute comments or questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself and join the conversation. Um, I'm happy to keep this open for as long as people want to hang around and chat. Um, but just out of respect for our panelists' times, we'll uh, close the formal part now. And if um, anyone needs to jump off, feel free. But thank you guys so much for joining us today.
And um, I always you. like to just give a little shout out for uh, projects that people are doing. So if you're looking for Christmas gifts, Jeff Katz's book. Uh, it's not going to work. Oh, no. There oh. it is. <laughs> it does not like that. If I hold it close enough to me, there we go. Oh, there you go. That's his book, uh, Almost. 1981. Highly recommended if you're looking for any Christmas gifts for anyone. Um, Dan Levitt's latest book uh, with Mark Armoire um, in Pursuit of Penance. Ah, Thank you. Kind of there. And uh, Mike, I unfortunately don't have a hard copy of uh, your book that came out a few years ago, but um, I know you have a book that's, um, that's also available too. And um, again, just thank you guys so much for joining us. This was a, a, a great chat. And if, um, if this is uh, one of the only good things that comes out of this uh, uh, lockout, um, <laughs> I guess that's well, no. It was my pleasure. And, and let, me, let me ask a quick question, which was spurred by uh, the latest comment I just saw come through. I would like to hear from Jeff and Dan, and I'll go first. Predict the date that you think this will actually end. And winner will be the hero and gets to buy a beer for the other two guys if we're all at Sabre this summer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going with February 1st. That's my date. I think February 1st is when this gets resolved. We got to we gotta write this down for posterity here. Why? Here do, do you have a reason why? I just <laughs> think, I, I think that's a real deadline in the sense that it gives, it gives enough time to clear the rest of the free agents and still get everybody to spring training on time so that all the players have a regular spring training. We don't have shortened spring training, which then compromises pitchers stretching out and works into the season. It also means no spring training games would be missed, which means no regular season has to be rewritten. So I think that really the last two weeks of January is when we'll see these two sides really give their best effort at negotiating. There's, there's no reason that they need to worry about anything for the month of December. Nobody's going anywhere. Nothing's happening. There's no deadline. I think January is when things start to pick up. And I think there's just too much money on the table for either side to risk letting it slip away by missing part of the season. So, so I think I don't have a date, but I have a concept and maybe we can figure out what date that is. When the first chunk of television money is supposed to go to the owners, and before that, the networks say, if there's not going to be a season, we're not paying you right now. That is likely to be when the owners start moving. I think players can, can stick it out a little longer. They're not going to get paid till spring training starts. They're not going to suffer, if, if at all, right? I mean, <laughs> like you, Mike said earlier, you know, probably every single major leaguer could take a year off and be fine. Um, and many did last year, right, guys? <laughs> to say, you know, Buster Posey, someone mentioned him, didn't play last year. You know, other guys who didn't play. When the owners start not getting the money that they feel is expected, this is what happened last year in 2020 when there was the haggling about games played. Much was settled when the TV contracts and the playoff money started to become an issue. And ultimately, that is what's going to decide this. This is what happened in 81. The owners had strike insurance. Um, and as soon as that was about to run out, the deal was settled. People on the inside kind of figured that's how it's going to work out. Either the players will cave or the owners will cave as soon as their insurance money dies. So that's my guess. I don't know if that's March 1st or April 1st. It's got to be before the first Sunday night ESPN game, right? <laughs> ESPN is not going to pay their share of the year if they don't think there's any games. So that's my hunch. Um, I'm I'm going to go with April 15th. I'm uh, I'm a little more pessimistic than Mike um, and Jeff. Spending your date, I I just don't see the negotiation really getting in year until February 1st. It's, it's just I don't know that there's a sense of urgency. Um, you know, again, I, I thought I was optimistic because I don't think the differences are all that wide. But the lines in the sand just feel like they've been drawn harder than they have some other times. So I'll stick, I'll go with April 15th. Well, this is one time I hope that I win and have to buy you guys a drink. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll prepare ours. I did want yeah, to. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I wanted to talk about something that Steve uh, wrote about who's watching baseball and who isn't. And, um, 
you know, he talks about in the chat about no one under 20 is watching the World Series. There's better studies on this than I can reel off. Maury Brown from Forbes writes about this a lot on Twitter. First of all, if the NFL is an aberration. The idea that anything can compete with the NFL, the NFL is not the norm. And we all have to kind of put that aside. But the, you know, the amount of people watching the World Series in 2021 versus in 1971 doesn't look so dramatically less until you compare uh, or when you compare it to who was watching All in the Family in 1971 versus who was watching The Big Bang Theory. The, the loss of viewership for network events is dramatic over time. That being said, networks love baseball. It is still the dominant programming in their marketplace. Um, also, I'll say I don't have a, I don't have any kids under twenty. My youngest is now almost twenty six. He doesn't sit and watch the World Series. He follows it um, on on through highlights on cut fours Twitter feed. Younger people are digesting the game differently. And that's why baseball alternative media is such a monumental success <laughs> that people, I mean, even myself, I, every morning I look at the box scores and the highlights. I probably don't watch more than 10 full regular season games now, whereas I used to watch them all the time. I'll watch all the postseason, but I digest the game differently. I don't think I'm any less informed. I think I'm pretty informed for an old guy. Um, but the way sports outside the NFL is is taken in now is very different. And I think there's a there's a there's a kind of interest in saying 50 million people watched game seven of the 71 World Series and 10 million watched it, you know, in 2021 game six. But how many people watched it on MLB.com? I mean, I, I think MLB has put out information on total viewership and it's a lot um and i will say this about baseball and um we've talked about this uh in the past about saber too people do tend to age into baseball more so than when baseball was the only game in town till whatever 1960 right so there are plenty of people who are like not huge baseball fans at 15 who by the time they become 30 they become super baseball fans. They like the pace. They like the interest. Um, there's something about the game that is more appealing to older people than to younger people, right? The NBA, MLB can't compete with the NBA for that audience. Uh, specifically, right, when the first thing the owners do is say, eliminate any <laughs> sign of current baseball players right now <laughs> that's how we'll appeal to the 18 year olds make sure there's nothing for them to see um so what is baseball's health i don't know how you view that right like i mean it's less pervasive culturally than it was in 1901 it is dramatically more profitable and revenue producing and if life in america has taught us anything that's the ultimate metric right <laughs> They're raking it in. Players, owners, everyone's raking it in. But everyone's trying to rake in what they perceive as what is their due. The owners would like 100% of it. The players would like whatever. <laughs> you know, they don't have a fundamental number. Otherwise, they'd, they'd be for a salary cap. Um, so by any way we view anything, baseball is healthy. Uh, I would agree with that. And I would say that... Um, the only metric that matters to owners is the financial side. And I've often heard, you know, baseball doesn't seem to be planning for the long run in some of the things they do. Well, that's not a big surprise because the owners aren't in it for the long run. There, there aren't owners who are gonna own these teams for 30 years. The average team ownership is less than 10 years. There are a few, you know, outliers, but on average, the team isn't owned that long. An owner gets in, they take some money out, they maybe win a World Series, and after a while, they're gonna sell that team off. Uh, and that's, that's the nature of this business. Uh, it's become a secondary business. 
there aren't teams, you know, there aren't teams that are owned by families anymore and th that this is their business. All of these are owned by people whose business is something else. And they're using this to make some money. They're going to make a lot of money at it in a short period of time. They also get a lot of attention, which a lot of them really desire. George Steinbrenner once famously said, it's a lot more fun owning the Yankees because I never got this much attention being the most successful shipper in the world. <laughs> he sure got on magazine covers as soon as he owned the Yankees. And, you know, they're very competitive and you can't buy a World Series trophy, but boy, you can win one. And then you got that for the rest of your life. I will say I this about the owner's competitive nature. Um, players have a singular identity. They're players. When it comes to the union point of view, there's not a Yankee position versus a Mariners position. When it comes to owners, even now, they have different priorities, right? So I can imagine that the Ricketts family, who just as a little background, I think paid 700 million for the Cubs, about 200 million in cash, leveraged that into buying every property around Wrigley Field, built hotels, uh, and now the franchise is worth $3 billion. But with a straight face told everyone midsummer, we can't afford our key players. It's, we don't have that kind of money. Um, they have a different pressure than Steve Cohen. They need baseball at Wrigley to fill the stadium, to fulfill their TV contracts, to put people in the hotels and the restaurants and, and on and on. Steve Cohen's side business is, is a trading firm. His, that is not at all contingent on whether the Mets play at all next year or ever again. I think this has always been true historically in labor, uh, in labor stoppages. Each owner has very particular needs and stresses, and they all might be very rich, but they're not all equally rich. And what their exposure is to their local teams, and you know, Manfred got some some crap when he said that baseball is not national, it's regional, um, and he should get crap for that. But he's also not completely wrong the needs of the cubs are even different from the needs of the white Sox. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and they're eight miles apart so i think that's where owners tend to split before players do just a just a feeling on a, on a sort of separate line just on the health of the game i i do think that i, I do think baseball has a pace of play problem um you, you know it's not just how long the games are but it's what goes on within those games. I mean, I've looked a little bit at just sort of how many balls in play, for example, per hour you have of a game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look at 2021, it was about 15.6. And if you go back just 10 years, the number was about 19, you know, it was almost 20. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's because you have time between innings, you have more strikeouts. And if you, you go back further than that, you're, you know, in the low, in the low twenties balls in play per inning or per hour of game, excuse me. So I, I just think that, you know, at some point, the game just doesn't have enough action. Uh, and I mean, if you go all the way back to, you know, when the game was popular in 1921, you were, you know, you, you were at 30 balls in play. You were, you were twice as many balls in play per hour. I mean, it was just, it was a different experience. And I think that, you know, baseball is a great game and it can survive at 15 balls in play per hour. But I think you're a hell of a lot better off if you're if if you if you have have more balls if there's more stuff happening. I don't think baseball is ever meant to be only about the pitcher batter confrontation. It was always mm -hmm. meant to be part of base running and fielding. It was always meant to be much more of a holistic game. And I think that that as we move away from that, um, I think we get more and more towards you know creating a game that's just not as interesting for people. Boy, I agree yeah. 100% with what Dan just said that. I think it's a completely different discussion and this can be your next one, Ryan, and get somebody that knows more about it than me, but boy, what can baseball do to think a little more long-term? Because if baseball is rich today as a flawed product, which I see it is as an entertainment product, imagine what it could be 10 years from now, if it was an even better entertainment product, how much it could be worth. The problem is trying to convince the owners today to think 10 years down the road, and not one year down the road, which is often the way they're, you're kind of thinking about this. It's funny, I have, I have 
mixed thoughts about pace of play um, because, you know, the, the games do drag. Um, but we're all old enough that, you know, <laughs> until pace of play became something people talked about, there's nobody in this room who at 10, 15, 20 could come within a half hour of knowing how much time they spend <laughs> at a game or watching it. You watched, and there might have been two hour games that were awful, and there might have been two hour and 45 minute games that were fantastic. And, you know, one, I think my favorite game of the last few years um, was whatever that 18 inning um, Dodger. Who did they lose to that year? Red Sox. Is that the one that went to like three in the morning and Max Muncie won? That game was so much fun. And part of the reason it was fun was whoever was watching on Twitter was like in the room together. Everyone was talking and laughing. That game was like six hours long. But I've seen games that were like two hours, 45, that uh, were, were pointless. So I don't, I don't know what that all means. I know when I lived in Chicago and had Cubs season tickets, I wasn't looking for less time at the ballpark because I could stay home for that. Um, and now, uh, if you believe what you read in the last year or so, where Adam Silver from the NBA said to Rob Manfred, baseball's pace of play is perfect for gambling. It's so much opportunity for people to gamble. <laughs> and you're seeing it. Like, I don't find that entertaining at all. When Joe Buck says, Hall of Famer John Smoltz, would you take the over or under on Charlie Morton strikeouts? <laughs> who the fuck cares? But... <laughs> There's a ton of people who are very entertained by that. And Major League Baseball sees tremendous profit in that. And I don't know this for sure. I don't know if the players share in that. So when you talk about where MLB owners want to go, if there's money to be made in the next 10 years that's increasing through gambling sites and gambling sites say, slow it down <laughs> because more people are betting per pitch than they did last year, then that's what we're going to see. Are we allowed to there? chime in here? I can, uh, is, is this? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. Um, yep. th thanks. Well, that I, I agree with Dan and Mike, and they know it because they've heard me harp on this, and I've been harping on pace of play for the last 35 years, although yep. Jeff's point is one I hadn't thought of, that uh, <laughs> considering the amount of money that's going to be coming in through gambling and if this uh, actually enhances the gambling. Maybe, maybe there isn't the motivation, you know, even C league and he was talking about pace of play, not length of games, which is what I've harped on, uh, that that's it. But, um, the owners have been trying to do something and I think they need buy-in from the players with the pitch clock. They have, well, they're using the pitch clock in the minor leagues. Now, uh, they're using, you know, they're using clocks that don't mean a thing. Uh, my wife does feel timing there and it, there's no enforcement of anything, but I, I do think for the, uh, if they are going to get a pitch batter clock, let's call it both. They need the players to kind of go along with them. The players are still in this. Don't rush me mode. Uh, I asked about bargaining chips earlier, like DH, would that be, it wouldn't be a huge one, but if they're looking for things to be trading off and on, uh, if the owner said, we'll give you the full DH, but, you got to go along with a time clock and not fuss about it and all of that. Do you see any of that working its way into these negotiations? Uh, yeah, I do, but they're going to be trivial points. I think that, you know, those are the easy things to do. They could probably figure that out in 15 minutes if everything else was done. And I, I do see things like that ultimately happening, but again, I see it as we'll give you the DH, you give us the pitch clock, not we'll give you the DH, you give us, you know, the same service time rules that we have now where we manipulate the players. So that that's what I see happening. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, I mean, the, the pace of play is different than the length of the game. Um, you know, and Jeff brings up a point. I remember watching that, you know, that Cubs Phillies game that was like 23 to 22 where Mike Schmidt hit four home runs. I died during that game, but it was one of the most exciting games I've ever spent five and a half hours watching. <laughs> and being at the ballpark, I have, I have complete tolerance for a long, slow game at the ballpark, as opposed to sitting at, in front of the TV. I do get bored, and I seldom watch a full game on television 
because it moves so slow. I will, I will follow it a lot of different ways. I go to a lot of games during the year and I enjoy them immensely. I watch very few on TV because I just find it too slow and it's, it's easy to do something else. Instead, I'll watch the highlights. Right. So I won't watch the Cubs on TV. Well, this last year, there was no reason to watch them at all. <laughs> but I'll, I'll pull up the highlights and I can watch all the best plays or I can even you know rapidly go through the game and watch things. And that's, that's a different thing. But I will admit, I had never thought about the dead time being great for gambling. That yeah, could so very well be. I, I, so I think, yeah, sorry. Yeah, Dan, you sorry. know, it's hard to, I was going to say two things. One is I, I think there'll be plenty of dead time for gambling, even if they speed it up a little bit. And, you know, if, if we're just giving games as an example, I mean, the one I love to use is game seven in 1960. Um, you know, that game was about two hours, you know, the 10 to nine game, the game was about two hours and 35 minutes long. There were zero strikeouts. I mean, it was it was a different game, and obviously baseball is a different place in 1960 than it is today. But I, I just think, you know, we I, I prefer something like that versus you know these three to two games in you know the middle of August that are three hours and 45 minutes, right. or a five to two games <laughs> you know, that have don't have even suspense in them anymore. What I find interesting about this, and Stu, maybe you can explain to me because you brought up pace versus length. Is a four-hour game with action better than a two-hour game without incessant commercials? And it seems to me that there's an absolute truth, right? What is the time spent viewing? And what is the time spent enjoying, right? So, you know, there are three-hour movies that are better than hour and 10-minute movies. One is three hours. It does, it, it's not one hour, right? So if you're worried about the games going long, then there are immediate ways to cut into that. So, so you talk about pace of play and pitch clocks. If that can cut 15 minutes off of a game time, but eliminating commercial breaks can cut out 30, isn't the latter better? Oh, lucky after, you. Look, oh, I'm sorry. Continue. I was just going to say, Je Jeff and Dan, or Mike and Dan, already got my ear full on this yesterday. No, yeah, go yeah. ahead. I'm sorry to cut you off. So, so, so my my my, for me personally, I don't mind more and more commercials that are split screen when there's a mound visit because I'm not really interested in the mound visit. I would rather see more of that than more full minute between inning breaks. Because that's not interfering with the time passing. Um, and it does kind of maybe get them to save revenue, maybe not. I mean, there, you know, there's certainly, <laughs> you know, MLB, there was talk about having uniform advertising, you know, in the next year or two. It's not like increasing ad revenue on one side decreases it on the other. <laughs> so they could say we're going to use uniform um patches for advertising and we're going to eliminate 50 percent of our commercials because we're concerned as you are that a three and a half hour game or a three hour game now takes three and a half well, so I, I don't get i don't really get it okay no it's still are we talking about length or pace and sure when yeah. you have commercial breaks that adds to overall time and if you're measuring it however you're measuring it by pitch by batter anything like that. Like I say, <laughs> lucky you, Jeff. Now you're going to hear the same rant that Dan and, <laughs> and Mike, uh, a few things in there, but, um, yeah, well, I, I did it. Somebody did a time study. This was on the sporting news in the late sixties. And there was an average of two minutes between innings. And in the nineties, I started doing this in 93. Um, and, you know, baseball had increased its commercial allotment from a minute to a minute and a half, but what was driving that, uh, time between innings was the amount of time it took to get the players on and off the field and warm up pitches and whatever else. And, and they've even kind of gone to it where a pitcher can get as many warm up pitches as he can get in, but they don't even enforce that. But uh, in 93, I was seeing between innings typically taking about two minutes, 22, 25 from last pitch to first pitch. And that wasn't being driven by commercials. Uh, and when they did some speed up efforts in 95, which I thought were effective, that made this game just feel better, a good game, even better because it moved along. 
some of the uh, times between innings were as low as one minute, 52 seconds. And there was a number that were under two minutes. So it wasn't the commercials that were driving that. And it's still not. And baseball has fluctuated, at least with non-national games in recent years, on its times. At one point, it was up to a standard of 225 minimum for a local game. It went down to 205. It went down to two. I can't, because of what I'm doing now, I can't spend as much time with my stopwatch between <laughs> innings. But I've watched it. And it's still... And, Watch the batter. Watch that clock go over the bullpen when it hits zero. And now the batter's just getting up to the batter's box. But, of course, he's still got to get in and not take his practice wings, just the jock strap, batting gloves. And it's still taking that. I did – I mentioned that one player I saw, I think when he was with Cleveland, Michael Bourne, when the minimum was 205, if he was a leadoff batter, they got the next inning started between 205 and 210. I've said many times baseball is the most inefficient sport. It can't even get its games consistently started on whatever it says the starting time is. <laughs> it's 7-10. It's almost always going to be 7-11, 7-12. NBA, the ball's going up at 7-10. Uh, NBA, they've got a, a, a clock over the basket for running down that timeout. And when that hits zero, there's a referee handing a ball to a player to inbound. And especially with 250 to 300 pitches in the game, any amount of time that you get that dicking around done, right. which is both. And, and I think it's been shown there's a rhythm between the players. Mark Burley's always going to fit pitch a faster game, but all the, the variety of the, the, the players that you have uh, interrupting that rhythm. And I did saints games last year too. So I saw that and yeah, it kind of does. It just to me makes the game more enjoyable. Yeah. Sure. If, if the pirates Yankees in 1960 went three hours, it would still be a great game, except I'm a Yankee fan. I'd say it sucks, but you know, it's uh, yeah, you can have you know, some games are just shitty because they're not good games, but I think yeah. the difference on some is like, yeah, that was really a good game. If you look at it, it man, that son of a bitch just dragged on and on. Couldn't they? Right. You know, and there's a lot of things too. players being smarter and taking more pitches and all of that. I don't have a problem. That's good yeah. strategy in baseball, but I think there are a lot of things. And at times the owners have looked at that and was Mike who said that, you know, the owners ought to be a little concerned at how damn dull their game is. If I didn't love baseball, yeah. I, I wouldn't love it. Huh. It's a good point. But Dan, maybe someday when we get back to every pitcher on the staff topping out at 80, <laughs> so every ball every ball is hittable we could have like a 1960 world series again i mean you know i i, I this is not to downplay the great history of baseball but you look at some of those games like it is an amazing like it took less time but the amount of i mean i guess it's all relative talent right so like when i was growing up and following baseball if anyone on the staff threw over 90 that was a major story for that year now if anyone throws 91 and gets through a game <laughs> they're like wow how did he do that so you know things used to take less time because pitchers weren't as good i don't think and everyone knew that they were supposed to make contact and not strike out and not walk but we're not going to go back to that I, I mean, well, I'm not. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not, I'm not saying you're advocating that. I just think that if you look at the number of balls in play per hour, which is sort of one thing that I've looked at, there's probably other ways to look at it too. It's clearly different now, even than it was. I mean, it's 15% different than it was just 10 years ago. Yeah. And there's only so far you can go having more strikeouts than, than, than hits. I mean, all of the stuff that people have been talking about. And I just, right. Again, my, my take is that the game has become much more of a pitcher-batter duel than it is a, a game of nine versus nine. Um, yeah. You know, base running has, 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 has gone down. You know, all the great field, there's still great fielding plays, but many fewer just because there's fewer balls in play. And so I, that, I, that, that's my more holistic. Yeah. You know, I just love that 1960 game because it no, it's know, a great makes example. the point. But, you know. <laughs> All right. Well, some great talk at the end there, too. Yeah. We're getting to be about 3.30, so we'll probably look to shut the room down. But thanks again, everyone. And uh, hopefully we thanks. can see everyone in uh, Baltimore this summer. Awesome. Thanks, Looking everyone, for listening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. That was terrific. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. All right, great. Thanks for putting it together, Ryan. That was great. Yeah, yeah thank, thank, you thank you very much, Ryan. Great that was, that was nice. Thanks for the invite. Right. Thanks, Ryan. It worked out, uh, work out just as I hoped. So. Excellent. See you soon. Yep. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.